more recipes all year round. And now that we've learned how to grow winter greens for year round fresh eating, we're going to hear about the health benefits of eating in season from our next speaker. Stan Murphy is a naturopathic doctor practicing at the Therapeutic Approach Health Center in Halifax. After graduating with her degree in biochemistry from Dalhousie, she attended the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine in Toronto. Sandra has an eclectic pet practice utilizing clinical nutrition, orthomolecular medicine, botanical medicine, homeopathic medicine, and lifestyle counseling to aid in the healing journey of her patients. Sandra has sat on the board of directors of the Environmental Health Association of Nova Scotia and is a former instructor at the Canadian School of Natural Nutrition in Halifax. And without further ado, I give you Sandra Murphy. It's always so awkward when you're being introduced to me. I'm going to get this out of my way. Can you hear me in the back? Is there? Okay. If I start to fade off, just let me know. Um, so I, I want to give a Shout out, she's not here yet, but I really want to thank Lucia for inviting me. Um, I always honor and I couldn't say yes. Her lovely mother. Okay. <laughs> um, and how wonderful I think this is uh, being around today. Um, well, actually, before I do that, I, I do want to thank my next slide, um, Captain Vegetable, for providing it for me or, or showing it to me. Um, and, and, no. <laughs> just a little joke, just to start off. Uh, found that around Halloween, I thought that was awesome. <laughs> because it just enhances everything, including the medicinal and uh, magical potions. Um, so just when I was sort of starting to think about it, um, I went on the uh, Select Nova Scotia website, and they have this great searchable function. Has anyone been on Select Nova Scotia? Perfect. And I was like, what am I craving? And the top one is peaches. I'm like, where can I get peaches local? Because I don't know about you, but I don't like stone hard ones in the grocery store. I want them warm on the tree, thank you very much. So I was amazed of where I could get them, and then I thought, I also want my winter squash, that's on the bottom. Um, we really had an abundance here in Nova Scotia, so it's really nice to be able to do this kind of talk when I actually can go and get the things that I want in the season. Um, what's the best way to like, hit it? <laughs> um, so just as my outline, I was gonna use the select notes Um, they are sort of outlined, of course I'm not an expert in organic soils, I'm not going to be talking about the politics, of course, of eating organic or eating local. Um, I really wanted to highlight what we have to start there on. Some ripe produce, fresh on the vine, is delicious. And I'm just going to touch on that, the number one problem I have, you know, I get the four-year-old in there, I hate vegetables, you know, because all they've ever had is overly cooked carrots or you know, broccoli that was wrapped in plastic for three weeks. That doesn't taste good to anyone. Um, I also want to touch on number five, get in touch with the seasons. Um, the Slack and Scotia, of course, is talking about, you know, it's, it's nicer to eat stews in the winter and you want a salad in the summer. And I think that's true, but I also want to touch on 3,000 years of Chinese medicine knowledge that really validates that and there's a reason that we go that way. Um, I also want to touch on try something new, number seven, and variety, dietary variety and how it brings so much more uh, nutrition overall to your diet than having a mono diet 365 days a year, which is what most people have that aren't at this conference. Um, number eight, eat healthy. Eating local healthy ingredients. If you're eating fruit at its, um, right, at its uh, nutritional height, um, before it has sat in a back of a truck series, which is which is what we want. So that's just my quick outline. Flavor, eat with the vitamins for balance, variety, nutritional peak, more vitamins. There, all done. I really think about all my Okay, this slide. <clears throat> One of my favorite foods. Um, I go crazy whenever certain berries are in season. I eat strawberries until I get hives, you know, the end of June, and then I don't eat them again all year. Um, we just, there seems to be this epidemic of, I call it anemic taste buds. People don't know what food tastes like um, because they've only had, actually what I always do, 
for my patients and say, get a bag, and usually I use organic um, because it does tend to be fresher, it's better soil. So I'll say, get a bag of organic carrots, get a bag of regular conventional carrots, and that's usually off season, so I we can debate later local, non organic versus organic from California. Um, but I said, just take those two, eat them, and see if you feel the difference. Which carrot would you want to eat? You know, which carrot you want to eat your care your children? Um, because if you don't want to eat your vegetables, then they're not going to give you anything. If food becomes an enemy of, oh, I have to choke down this you know, spinach soup, well, then I believe that your body is going to get the same nutrition out of it as when you're like, oh, can we do this? We so good. You know, you, you take in more, your cells are happier. That makes sense. Um, so I think we're not we. They are too dependent on sugar, salt, and deep frying to give that flavor to their food. Um, I'm amazed when at a restaurant I'll see people get their food and they haven't tried it. They grab a salt shaker, put the salt on. Like, that's amazing to me. Um, okay, next, next slide. This is my which would you rather eat slide. I got my um, receptionist, Amy Marshall. She had all these beautiful pictures of um, fresh fruit from Shanti, uh, Shanti's farm. Sorry? Shani's, thank you. She works for Shani and she also does some of the raw chocolate. So she has this beautiful left, the strawberry. And when I think of strawberries off season, there are these white in the top, cut into them, the white core. I don't think a strawberry is a strawberry unless it's red all the way through. That's what I love and that's what I want to eat. So that's when I think in local, that's the main difference to me. Want to eat a strawberry or a real strawberry? Um, and I am a little weary about, um, I'm, I'm, I added a little um, information that isn't in the slides that we should can send out to you, but I will send you the new slides if you want them. But I am weary of some produce coming from California, even if it's like a little organic. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, I'll let you know there's no farmer, no food. I know there's N-O farmer, N-O food, but I, um, if we're talking about local and we are out there meeting our farmer, he can tell us, you know, what rivers near him, what other farms are near him, is there anything I have to worry about? Whereas PC Organics, most of their lettuce is from Salinas, California. And it's very, it's open information. The FDA um, studying the percolates um, in the water, which um, are found in a lot of different things. It's can be a natural byproduct of fertilizer, but it is also a big um, component of rocket fuel, solid rocket fuel. And because of where Salinas is, um, it's been contaminated, the groundwater's been contaminated by the rocket fuel. So, yes, you're organic, you're not putting anything on, and the water can test fine with a lot of different chemicals, but percolates are in there. And I don't want my lettuce to have rocket fuel in it. So, um, things like that make me want to stay local because I know there's no rocket fuel in my water. So that's just one sort of aspect. Um, I'm sure you've all seen this, the dirty does and clean doesn't. Um, environmental working group, this is sort of my reaction. This is there, cut it out, put it in your wallet. They also have a great app for your iPhone, you just quickly clean up the letter. Um, I just wanted to highlight on the dirty does and the important. Um, Grapes being the big one of the worst, um, and it's hard to get local grapes, of course. Um, but when I always think of you know buying local, still you have to. Um, sorry, where am I going with this? Um, the peaches, of course, being the worst, and most of the peaches that we're having, of course, off season are all over. That's what I'm saying. Peaches, strawberries, entering grapes, bell peppers, blueberries. The um, celery, when you're buying that off season, it also tends to be the most contaminated. If someone can't afford to eat organic, they're getting the most pesticides. Okay? Next slide. Okay. Any questions so far? Um, so, just going to touch on Eastern perspectives. Do we have any acupuncturists or Chinese practitioners? Okay. Um, so I'm sure we all know the yin yang, light, dark, wet, dry, female, male, everything exists in opposites. 
But the Chinese always said, you have to eat the food that matches your nature or where you, the environment you're in. Um, my Chinese professor, uh, Chinese medicine professor, would always be shocked that in the heat of a Toronto summer, we would be barbecuing. Because he's like, that's just the worst thing to put in your body. Because you're taking all the moisture out of the food very quickly. The charring is very warming in Chinese medicine. Um, so he just thought, plus the animal protein was so also warming, he just said, that is the worst thing you can eat. You should be barbecuing in February. I'm like, you know, no one was outside. Um, but to them, that's the idea of you want to be in balance. So because you're in a state of it's dry, it's hot, it's parched, you should be having wet foods, the, the raw, the vegetables, the salads, the greens, um, the you know, the tomatoes, the watermelons, the six things, which inherently makes sense. But the Chinese were saying not 2,000 years ago, that it balanced your yin yang. Um, that was just my, we're talking. Um, yeah, so make sure you want um, to warm up. Spring, spring's a time of change. Uh, it's also a, a big time for your liver in Chinese medicine. And when your liver is transitioning, when it's getting rid of whole winter of uh, debris and we would sit around and have it really sweated as much. Um, that's when you need the components that really support your liver. And those are the ones you get in the spring vegetables that are high in asparagus. It's high in those first collard greens that come. It's high in, um, well, beets really good, but uh, the lemons when they first came out of here they are for local. Um, summer, summer again, we cooling things. And then we get into autumn, it's not quite dry yet, well today especially, um, but it is getting cooler. So that's where those really, the late summer squashes, the early winter squashes, they tend to be very moist. And when you steam them, it's almost an instant soup. But not because that's what you need at that time. Whereas when you're in the dead of winter, the vegetables are kind of, you know, I'm still doing okay. The potatoes get quite dry. Um, but when you cook them a long time, um, and anything you cook a long time, animal protein for sure, it's going to give you that heat that you need, um, not to temper salads. Um, unfortunately, the people that I see in the dead of winter that say, I'm a raw foodist, that's the people I go, oh, because they're going to hate me. Because I either, they have to have super, super spicy, you know, raw pad thai that they make from zucchini or whatever, or they have to add a little cooked food, maybe at least 40% of cooked grains or steamed or carrots or that sort of thing because they're in too much cold wet into a cold wet environment, slowing down the digestion, you know, adding more fun to the system, that's not Chinese medicine. But um, it's it's funny because they come saying, oh, we've got a natural who would say, oh, we're doing just great to work the raw Buddhists. I'm like, yes. In the summer, you are off foods. In the winter, you have to eat those cooked vegetables. Okay. So I just kind of put them all in there for when you, uh, if you want to see now. Uh, what specifically they say? Um, so spring, those first onions, the leeks when they come up, the first leafy greens, mushrooms when they pop up in the, the woods in the springtime. Summer, you want to keep the body cool. That's the, the wet um, watermelon, strawberries, tomatoes, cucumber, beet sprouts, fish. Fish is very moisturizing. Um, autumn, turning inward, pears, the pumpkin. You can see it all very local. Um, the peppers are up, the apples, having the cooked gorgeous the soups, the stews. And then in winter, you want to warm with the protein foods. That's where the uh, grass-fed animals come in handy. The cooked fruit, all those apple sauces we're putting up now are becoming handy. Still good fruit vegetables. Kanji, anyone I know? Captain Vegetable loves kanji. Uh, a type of rice porridge that is cooked for hours with lots of six parts large, one part rice, Captain Vegetable. Okay. Um, which is very warming and healing to the digestive system, will be perfect in winter. Wines, excellent. Vinegars, eggs, and lunches. Um, so, any questions about that? Just speaking right through.
Yes. Um, we have mushrooms in the spring. Sorry? Mushrooms? You have them in the spring? That's when they're healing. There are no spring mushrooms? I thought the mushrooms came up as soon as they got spring at one. No, I'm just wondering why they have them in the spring. Oh, why? Just to the Chinese, the property they have is helps liver, helps to clear things, helps to move a stagnant body. So that's why they're helpful then. It would be helpful any time of year, but spring is when the Chinese would say, we actually prescribe that, you need to go get mushrooms, you need to get squashed in the winter. Duck is a big prescription to the Chinese. Yes? Gorgeous, yes. I just didn't add it, of course. Yeah, her is perfect. Yes. And again, nice and juicy. Any of like anything from the radish family, yeah, would be perfect. Yes. Good point. Um, I just um, the next slide, I just wanted to throw up some studies of people are looking at variety, the dietary variety. Um, there's sort of two camps when it comes to getting people to eat better. One camp is Let's just tell them, you know, eat porridge every morning, have a salad with some chicken breast at lunch, and have one or two things at supper time, and have this for a snack. Like if we just can get them on a routine, at least they're, you know, not straying and end up eating potato chips for dinner. But the other side is saying yes, but if they're only having, you know, basically ten different foods in a day, and that's all they eat, we're missing the variety. And that's where all the healing properties of food come in. Um, a lot of the, the debate that I hear a lot too with vitamins and, and should I take a multivitamin Dr. Murphy and do I need it? I eat really well. Uh, yes, but we also know that um, food can be deficient in some vitamins. If you're, again, someone who eats 10 different foods, you're missing maybe a purple vegetable that would give you a certain proanthocyanin that is helpful for your heart vessels, but you aren't getting orange peppers, but you're not doing carrots. So yes, you're doing a carrot team, but you're also missing some of the pro A's that carrots have. And like every different type of food you can have, especially in the plant families, the fruits and the vegetables, you're amassing this huge medicine cabinet of healing phytochemicals <coughs> that we don't, we haven't even studied, we don't even understand them all. Um, I, I tell my patients uh, for prostate cancer, one of the great things we're finding is an ounce of pomegranate juice every day. Is it the resveratrol that's in there that we're hearing a lot from red wine? Mm -hmm, not really. Is it one of the purple pigments that's in there? Could be. But it seems to be when you combine everything, all 100,000 different chemicals in that pomegranate juice, that's what exerts the anti-cancer effect. And we can't just extract something else and go, oh, take this. Um, so the variety is where you're getting all those things. You might not every day have um, asparagus or something like it, but when you eat that in the spring and that's what your body needs, that's when things really start to move and happen. But if you um, have broccoli every day and you're like, well, I'm getting my green vegetable, you weren't getting that asparagine or that certain chemical that's only in asparagus. You know what I mean? So I, I do like to see a variety in diet diary, though if you are a registered dietitian, it's it's nice to see, okay, you know, every day they're getting this many calories, every day they're getting this many grams of fat. That's where we differ. <laughs> so I just mass up it's a very quick um comments search. Um, Journal of Nutrition, the Journal of the American Dietetic Association, European Journal of Clinical Nutrition, um, Obesity Research, and everyone's saying higher dietary variety is associated with better nutritional status. So I think eating in season, there's certain foods you eat certain times of year, some you don't eat the rest of the times of year, and that's perfect, that's fine. Your diet's always changing. Okay, um, next one. So, <laughs> standard American diet or aka the mono diet, aka the brown diet, is what I call it. Um, over 50% rice, potatoes, bread, and pasta. Some vegetables, some fruit. Greens, I think that's quite um, ambitious to say that much greens. I believe they're counting iceberg lettuce as green. 
I think that's why it's there. And like protein, of course, um, and then oils. Oils, I think, should be bigger too. Um, and then, of course, the delivery system for the uh, most of those products is the cheeseburger. Um, and then uh, Marion Nestle, she included in her book, uh, Food Politics, the lovely food pyramid at the bottom here, um, showing the tipping point of the, the fats definitely outweighing fruits and vegetables and even the milk group um, that she said she got from the National Calories Beef Association. So they were concerned that there wasn't enough meat to fat, I guess. So um, in saying that, there was, I was looking for the original study, but it's just kind of been this term that's been propagating around, that they did do a survey, I believe it was age three to 14 children, um, they did two the schools, saying how many vegetables a day do you eat? And then they actually looked, they asked their parents to fill it through there. Um, and unfortunately, most of those children, it was one vegetable a day. Any guesses of what the vegetable was? Can you do that slide? Used to count as a, it just changed within the last three years that it no longer can count as a vegetable serving, but that was their beautiful fruit, uh, vegetable serving. Um, and of course, the first ingredient is hydrogen sperm syrup. But anyway, we won't get into that. Second most common vegetable, of course, was not a potato, but a french fry. So we're missing the skin, all the nutrients tend to be found in the skin and just underneath the skin. Um, so really it was a starch, deep fried starch that they were getting. So very, very sad. So not just the local being delicious, but local with variety. I think children appreciate that um, of, I don't get broccoli every Friday, but oh look here is we haven't had chard in you know six six months or something, and I get to have it again. And oh, maybe I like it this time. Those those types of things. Or oh, I didn't like butternut squash last year. Maybe I like this year. But we just keep reintroducing it every time it comes back around. That's a really good way to kind of wake them up and, and give them a right to say, yeah, I'll try it this time. Yeah. Um, okay, I'll go back to some. So also with variety, um, unfortunately. When you look in your uh, grocery, fruits and vegetables aren't chosen because you know they're gorgeous and they taste the best. Unfortunately, this variety of tomato, and I'm sure there's experts in this room that can talk about how the food politics of it, that this is the one you pick when it's at this state, and it will survive for this long. It loses not as much of the nutrition. So it's, it's chosen for its shuffling, basically. Um, instead of prioritizing taste and nutritional quality. So it's those varietal decisions. So we, it's only now that I've noticed in the last three years maybe that, oh, there's this many kinds of great tomatoes and oh, a campino tomato instead of just field tomato, greenhouse tomato, both tasting a bit like hard work when it's January. Any questions? That's great. Speak to the Thanks. So that's my big. Take a message as an entrap. Eat food as nutritional peak. There's nothing quite like to looking at that nutritional um, standpoint of someone who has gone to the market that morning, gathered their food, cooked it or not cooked it as the state may be, eaten it that day, and to look at their bloodstream, what is coursing through uh, that night versus someone who has had to have you know, long transported vegetables. I've just been sitting there. It is just amazing, and that's where the healing power comes from. I think a lot of these, um, another controversy in, in sort of hit this kind of non conventional medicine is sort of people doing juice fats for healing cancer or healing their heart disease, or you're starting to see this now of these radical, not radical, but they change the whole life and just go on cleanses, go down to Mexico and get their cancer treatments. Is it that they're going to a place where that papaya was picked off the tree and put in your plate? You eat it and you are getting that nutrition versus by eating papaya in Canada and not getting all of its nutritional peak. So it, I don't know if it's Mexico is the healing place, it's just it happens to have all the fruit trees. <laughs> so, um, uh, next one. Um, so, brightness. Um, yes. 
<laughs> I've seen <laughs> um, do you need juice sauce? Yeah. Oh, I think if you love it in Costa Rica and you don't want a juice sauce, I think that would be that's perfect. We can cover that, that'd be great. Once here, that'd be fabulous. <laughs> there you go. Think of Bella Vista, it's a tree house community. Uh, plus all the, if you can get some of the fresh air, that would be just perfect. And vitamin D, I think that's the other reason people feel better with that. So. Um, so I do want to talk a little bit, again, that sort of transport issue. They have found, I mean, it's, they haven't studied every fruit and vegetable, but certainly for red peppers. Um, I would also say orange peppers and yellow peppers. But tomatoes, apricots, peaches, papayas, um, they, they just did vitamin C, and I would imagine beta carotene and a lot of different um, vitamins are the same. They are showing to be higher when you actually take it off when it's ripe from the mother plant versus unripe and allowed to, uh, they say ripen, but really it's just come to full color. Um, I don't think that taste of a soft peach that was still hard when it came off the mother plant is the same as ripe from the tree, but I'm a bit biased. Um, so that's pretty self evident. But again, the children are going to want to eat it. Um, so the clock is ticking. As you know, when you eat fresh vegetables, you can see that get lots of nutrients. Um, you can put in the argument that this is where the flash frozen fruits and vegetables are very helpful. That's not part of the talk right now, but of course that would preserve the nutrients. If you can't get it from your farmer, then you would look for frozen, but then you have to know where it's coming from what's in the groundwater, these sorts of things. And then is it the time of year that your body really wants that food? But if you can't get it from the farmer, I would go with the frozen. I guess. Where do the nutrients go? Where do they go? They just break down. They're still there, but something like vitamin C is a very long molecule, so it just gets naturally clean. It's just the enzymes in the fruit breaks it, it essentially eats the vitamins, the vitamins itself. A lot of the chemicals like um, salicylic acid in there, it's the, the plant's sunscreen, it's the plant's bug spray. It's how it protects itself. And once it's been picked, it starts to naturally degrade and break down. Again. So it's still there, it's just broken up. And then I can't use it because I need it in the full state because I can't manufacture it and knit it back together. And there it's, are, it's yeah. the process of ripening that builds those more complex Really to a point, and then once it gets overripe, that's when the rotting process starts. Of course, it breaks down again, but yes, that's definitely. It knits it together. There is something like vitamin C, humans, fruit eating bats, given apes, and hamsters, no, sorry, gerbils, hamsters can, they can only vitamin C in their liver because it's knitted together just from glucose, which is why fruit has more, um, and sweet vegetables have more vitamin C than non sweet. Um, it's made from sugar, um, but we can't, so we have to eat it. We were missing that enzyme as part of our, one of the mutations we had, along with fruity and bats and guinea pigs. <laughs> guinea pigs. Um, yeah, so good question. Yeah, it's still there, just we're not using them. No good. Um, next one. So I think the biggest problem that I have with my patients is that loss of texture and loss of crunch, and loss of um, just the fresh, the freshness of the vegetable, the smell. Uh, I hate vegetables that smell like their packaging, um, that smell musty, but certainly, of course, we're gonna be missing some of the nutrient losses. Um, temperature, atmosphere, relative humidity, and sanitation must be well regulated. Unfortunately, there is a lot of steps from our table these days, as a lot of your experts in. I'm convinced that humidity and temperature are kept optimal at every single point. I had a refrigeration expert into my office, and he's actually saying he doesn't buy anything frozen from any of the grocery stores because they don't keep their freezers even at optimal temperatures. So I, I would believe that. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So much. Um, so I have it, I find it hard to believe that all the trucks can be at the perfect temperature and the shipping containers on the boats. So we know there's nutrient losses. It's just how much and how quickly. Um, 
course, carrots are a little more resilient than green beans are, as you can see. But it makes sense. So the green bean of season, they're usually gray anyway. Who wants to eat them? That's where the, all the restaurants can come up, I guess. Um, any questions about that? short talk, but it's, everything's very self-evident. Um, the major thing with eating in season is flavor. People want to eat more because it tastes better. You have less nutrient loss. And we also are finding for 3,000 years of Chinese knowledge that you're benefiting your body by eating at a time that you're matching the environment. Okay. Also, I love two questions. Yes? So, about uh, nutrient loss, is protein and processing. How much is, like, if I'm canning tomatoes and they're boiling for five minutes, how much nutrients is actually in those? <coughs> well, boiling for only five minutes is not bad. Um, it's more of exposure to light and time. You have locked it in. Um, you might have broken down. It's more the long molecules again, the vitamin C's. But the, you're getting all of the um, plant pigments, the lycopenes, things like that that we hear about. Um, you've actually liberated some of those chemicals, but okay, there are some that uh, we can't get when we eat raw, um, that are usually in the skin, certainly tomato skins, blueberry skins. When you freeze, squash freeze blueberry, you cook it, cranberries are the same, you can liberate extra chemicals that weren't available if you just ate it, because of course you can't break down the cellulase of the skin. Um, so it's a nice fertilizer, but. So what about like vitamins? Are most of vitamins going to be lost from cooking? Like Baby carotene wouldn't be. Vitamin C would probably just 10, 15 percent. When you boil it for longer, say 20 minutes, is when you see significant losses, which is how my mother cooked carrots when I was growing up, right? 20 minutes for carrots, 20 minutes for potatoes. All of it was pretty much gone, and it all came out with water. But you're also keeping the water with the tomato. You're cooking it in the brine, and then you're using that as the sauce. So it's still in the water? A lot of it. The vitamin C is broken. It's broken, but not all of it. Like I said, probably around 10%. Um, I can find that chart for you and send it to you, but... Because I know, like, when you pasteurize apple juice, you lose all the vitamin C. Yeah. Not all of it. Some of it is quite heat resistant. Because you look at pasteurized apple juice, it's vitamin C zero. <laughs> is that conventional? No, that's like... Yeah? Well, why do you want to pasteurize it? Why don't you get it wrong? So if you're selling it, there's regulations on that. No, it's on the side. Oh, excellent. So, but you are, even if you um, are cooking the apples, again, you're still, it, as long as you're keeping the liquid that it's been, it is cooked, it's it's the product. So it has um, to do temperature as well? Like? It has to do a lot with temperature. Yeah. Yeah. It has to do a lot with temperature. Because it's that physical force, the heat that moves the molecule and then Break your heart. Yeah. Maybe just serve very gently. Treat it very kindly, yes. Yes. Well, you would preserve all the vitamin C for sure. It's just what are you going to do when you get to the other side? If you like to put it anyway, you go for convenience. But if you're um, doing something like uh, blueberries, I would say freeze um, tomatoes. I think definitely you can freeze tomatoes on the point. Um, uh, but you know, uh, fermenting. I mean, that can preserve quite a bit. Um, salting can preserve a bit. But then cold storage, and you've got something going cold storage. Perfect. Yeah. But it ceases. Yes. Uh, just a. Uh I'm curious about nutritional differences between varieties of, of the same vegetables. Sure. It can vary significantly from tomato to tomato. Totally. Um, thank you. I meant to mention that when we had the picture of the heirloom tomatoes. Um, the older varietals that have the increased pigments, so we're not just talking about red tomatoes here, we're talking about yellow grape tomatoes or the purple monster tomatoes. It's those different colors that impart a lot of health um, benefits. So I can't tell you off the top of my head, you know, 
this varietal versus this one. But the more colorful your diet is, the better. So even within the tomato group, to have, you know, we call them orange poppers in my house, but the little orange green tomato, have the big purple guy, have the dark red guy, have the light pink one. Um, you're really giving your body a lot of stuff. And so, yes, they all have vitamin C, yes, they all have vitamin E, they all have a little bit of iron, but it's the pigments that I think is, is where the health benefits are. When you look at someone who has a brown diet that takes a multivitamin, to someone who maybe takes a multivitamin because they want the uh, extra insurance, but they have this variety in their um, uh, diet of fruits and vegetables, that guy always looks much healthier. Is that, is that true universally? Like the difference in pigments is like I'm just thinking of rainbow carrots, which I find yeah. really, really baseless. Uh, <laughs> the first ones one. can be. <laughs> uh, but like the variation in pigment would be healthy. Very you helpful. A variety of care may not take up as many nutrients as the soil. Well, nutrients or flavor of nutrients are, can be different and, yeah. and independent of each other, unfortunately. Um, Though I, you know, usually with certainly green beans, asparagus, broccoli, you can taste when something has lost a lot of nutrition because the taste also suffers. But I never noticed that with the uh, rainbow carrots. That's funny. Even with your eyes, I guess, I never, never noticed. Um, but it, universally, it should be that the more pigmented, the more nutrition you're getting out of it. Um, you know, having golden beets and purple beets, I think. Is always going to be helpful too. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just wondering that something like, say, a broccoli and cauliflower, what could be the difference between steaming it and that for a meal versus mashing the oil and the pot? Well, the difference when you're steaming, the heat envelops the vegetable, it does penetrate, um, but it doesn't um, slough away the vitamins. It can't, there's no vector for it to. There's condensation, of course, but it isn't enrobed in, say, the boiling water, where it can just leach out. Essentially, you're making a cauliflower tea when you boil the cauliflower. You're leaching some of the chemicals out, and you see that in the water. Steaming, you see significantly less, because it's really only what condensated on the vegetable and fell off that is able to draw away nutrients. That's why steaming is much better than you can. I always recommend steaming or roasting in its own skin, like say beets. Sort of idea, you are preserving a lot more.